All right, hello. How's, how's the one person in here doing? <laughs> uh, so tonight I decided instead of reading a book because as anyone that has kept up with anything I've done in the last at least week knows, I just finished writing my memoir manifesto, which is the very first book I've ever written that is actually a book <laughs> rather than just a micro chapbook of poetry, of which I have eight, but I have never actually promoted anywhere. Um, and I figured, like, somebody recommended to me that I start reading more of my poetry again, because that would used to be a night of the stream. And I was going to read some articles that someone recommended. So this is what I do on Thursdays and Saturdays, Victoria. So I basically read, I do, I have a Twitch and i i stream i read on thursdays whatever we we want to it is it's poetry night <laughs> and um i'm currently you know promoting the book i just wrote the very first full book memoir manifesto of my life as a late in life realized neuro queer person who has had substance abuse and experienced a statistically expected level of sexual violence for a late in life realized autistic assigned female at birth person so I recently put all of my poetry books, like the micro chat books that I mentioned a moment ago, I made them free through Kindle Unlimited. So if you have that, you can just read them if you would like. But the other night I saw that someone stocked out my poetry on my blog, like hardcore. <laughs> and so I don't know who it was, but I'm dedicating this poetry night to them because they inspired me to go back to my blog, which I consider like the elephant graveyard of all my poetry I haven't published. Some of which I have though. And it's just been sitting there and I forget, I, cause I, what I always try to do is it all basically was born there and it lives its early life in my blog, Wazo Words. So that's why the, the title of both the Twitch stream and the TikTok live is Wazo words. But basically, I leave them there until I publish them somewhere. And then I usually move the published ones to drafts so that people can find them elsewhere. <laughs> but this is also the same site where my makeshift link tree is. So if you've ever been to my link tree, that's actually my poetry website. <laughs> it didn't used to be something I attached to my actual identity. It just was I, everyone just went by. So, cause for anyone that doesn't know, I think I explained this on live like the other day, but for anyone that doesn't know French, Wazo in French just means bird. Um, so Wazo with an X at the end means birds words. <laughs> and that's what I called it. It's, I didn't. And then eventually I started actually publishing my poetry and I was like, all right, let me actually attach this to my identity, even though this has all of my dirty laundry in it, because it's the place, like I talk about in my memoir, it's the place where basically all of my late night thoughts go. And all of my, like, not requited infatuations or compulsory heterosexuality that may have just been anxiety, as, as we'll see. So basically what the plan is, is I was going to look through to see which ones the <laughs> the person that stocked it out last night we're looking at and then i was going to read some of those so let me figure out how i can do it it looks like my twitch chat is like acting up again like it was the other day so but if anyone could oh you know what that reminds me actually so i always have captions on my twitch so if, if anyone could um could use those or benefit from them in any way they should, in just a moment, as you see, start live populating. This is my blog, though. So this is where it's at. Um, oh, nice. Okay, cool. Thank you, Ed. Oh, also, thank you for the heart, Russell. So I was going to probably basically go through my blog on my iPad over here. Because I got to look behind the curtain of my blog, you know. <laughs> I got to make sure... I gotta make sure nobody sees the secrets behind the Wizard of Oz curtain that is the background of my blog. And um, I'm gonna just choose some at random, that, and then we're gonna see if I like them, because 
to be honest, the reason why I consider my poetry blog the Elephant Graveyard, and I have a poem just exactly about this, which I might start with because I think it's just kind of goofy and, and fun. Um, but this is where all my poetry that I like and poetry I don't like lives. <laughs> so that's what, uh, yeah, you know, what? we'll look for that one first. So basically for anyone that's never been to my poetry website, there's a little search bar over here. And if you click into it, <laughs> you can type words into it. I think that should be enough probably. Oh, apparently, um, oh yeah, okay, I didn't call it elephant, okay, here we go. So this one about this blog is just called Excavation Station. So for anyone that would like to actually see the poems themselves as I'm reading them, you're going to be better off going over to my Twitch because I'm going to show them at the same time. Like I said, though, on Twitch, I also have the live captions. And now that I know, I might actually have live captions because I was talking to one of my favorite creators on the app, um, which I have many of, but this is one of my newer favorite ones. And I learned that from watching their live, TikTok now has live captions populating. So maybe you can see them on here, too. And that's great. I didn't know about that. So that makes me happy. But anyway, like I said, this one is just about I got very meta. This one's about the blog itself. I've had it since like 2016, 2017-ish. Um, hold on, let me close out a... Like I said, the live Twitch chat is like acting funky for some reason. Like it was the other day, Ed. Or I guess the other week at this point. Where it's like not showing, it's just like loading. And then not showing me <laughs> anything in the stream kind of a useless purpose because it's whole its whole job is to just show me the the fucking comments <laughs> there we go i think it worked okay anyway like i said this first one's called excavation station not too long ago i went through every single one of my poems on here and i <laughs> this was before the ai art scandal i was like, oh thank you Squ welcome squirrel greetings to you too so I went through every single one of my poems and I took a piece of them and AI generated them. So that's what the pictures at the top are. And then I just add bird <laughs> in the corner because, you know, I didn't actually create it, but my poetry technically did. So anyway, this first one goes like this. After all my digging and burying, this blog is the elephant graveyard of my work unsightly dead carcasses of my bad poetry as far as the eyes can see if we're lucky he her haptics by some keystroke of miracle a little budding poem will rise from these ashes peek her head out my my wreckage and light us all a gay <laughs> so if that gives you this is actually i think a rare form for me like i don't remember what i was doing the night that i did this I'm pretty sure, so I wrote it, obviously, it must have been after I was at my lowest, and I was just feeling like a silly little guy. It was wackadoodle time, and <laughs> I needed to write this poem about this blog, because I think it became apparent to me one night when I was looking through all the old ones, like, since i have been doing it since 2016, 2017, I spent lots of time looking through the old ones and being like, I don't like this at all. And then like trying to go through and revise some of them so that maybe they become something I actually enjoy. But yeah, I remember going through a lot of them probably when I was replacing the images at the top with AI pictures and just being like, this is just a bunch of fucking, like there, this reminds me of that Lion King video game on Sega. That's this reminds me of like this is just where all my old poetry goes to die because I'm not really doing anything with it. I like didn't write any poetry from the years like I'm trying to think. We could technically go through and see. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Because I got it separated basically the pre COVID words and the present code words. Although, of course, these are not updated. I haven't written very much poetry at all recently. But, yeah, let me see. I think this will just take us to the... Oh, wait, no, that's... See, I don't know my own website. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm usually just behind the, the scenes on it. I wish I put the dates. Maybe I'll put the dates eventually. But, yeah, there's a point at which maybe, like, after I moved away from my PhD, I basically stopped writing until COVID hit. 
poetry that is <laughs> and then COVID hit and i was like well oh, this is the way i process all of my feelings uh that i keep so hidden from myself yet express all over my face and chest and i need that i need to express them again <laughs> so anyway let's let me look through and like i said for anyone that just came in i am reading my poetry that i have forgotten about for the most part and there was somebody that I saw, because for anyone that doesn't know how WordPress works, <laughs> if you get a lot of traction on it, it lets you know. And I had like 60 some views of like a bunch of my poems last night. And I was like, all right, so who's stalking me out? Like, <laughs> let me see. Let me see what's going on here. And I was looking through some of my old poems and I was like, you know what? I like some of these a lot more than I remembered. So. What I was going to do is go through them and read, read the ones that I like. Another thing about WordPress is, is that they updated so that you can't see the stats on the same app anymore. And it's been really fucking annoying. They make you go to like, if you have a blog, they make you go to this other website. It's called Jetpack. And it basically, so I'm having to download that right now so I can see my own fucking stats. Even though literally just a moment ago, it let me see them. It's just face ID. Ah! Okay. Checking stats. Okay, here we go. All right, so like I said, I thought I'd be a goofy little guy and read some of the poems that this person who stocked out my poetry last night <laughs> was appreciating, and we'll see if we also appreciate them or if I, if I don't like them. All right, but for anyone that has... Uh, has or hasn't known. Another reminder that I wrote a memoir and finished it three days ago. And I think if you read it, this poetry is going to make a fuck ton more sense to you. <laughs> Which is why, like I said, I made all my uh, micro chat books of poetry available through Kindle Unlimited for free now. Because I thought if somebody would read that and they like the poetry that's in my memoir, because there's at least one poem in every single chapter, I figured that they would like to also read more of my poetry perhaps but obviously don't let me tell you how to live your life <laughs> so, anyway let's uh let's read actually this one they stuck out this one i made this one into a tiktok once it's called i'm not sure i love you <laughs> i'm not sure i love you but the way you build yourself into my life keeps me warmer. Forgive me if my heart mistakes you for mine. Hard and fragile ribs, built to be inside my chest, there to wrap so snug inside. I feel you beat nearby, sweetheart. I am no stranger to stress fractures. I have broken many bones. They grew back like yours. I know the cold outside and how it has impacted all our inside softnesses. Curl around my formings and please do not break anymore. I dream of an if one. I see how we could grow back strong in ourselves with complex treatment. Be with me, merged marrow. Our cells are born blue to turn red, repairing post-woe collisions with care. And then I have another little AI picture. I forget what I must have typed in the bottom part. There you go. So as usual, like I said, I think if I'm perfectly honest, the vast majority of my poetry is me just oozing over some form of like unrequited love or at least unexpressed and acted upon love <laughs> or the idea of love more likely because <laughs> i think as you'll read in right you know if you read my memoir let me turn around so you can see my goofy fucking face uh tiktok where can you access it oh yes so it is through my link tree so if you go i think i have my link tree linked on to twitch and I wish that, you know what, I might be able to fix up after the stream, I might be able to fix up the Twitch so that my book would, if you click on it, take you to the memoir. But like I said, if you go to my link tree, it's like 
the third or second thing in the link tree. So that's where you should do it. You can also just Google my full name, Dr. Bernard Upward Bowen, and it should come up. I also checked, I know somebody the other night was saying that the memoir wasn't available in the UK, like the paperback copy. And I checked today at like a few different international versions of Amazon, and I think it's available now. And the Kindle version for sure is. So anyway, let's see what else the other person was talking about last night, shall we? <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah. So I have this one that's called The Favorite Part. I wrote, like I said, a fuck ton of them about, or not about, but around the time that COVID hit. Because, you know, when you're, and that's why if I really wanted to, and people are into the first memoir, I think easily I could write a second part purely dedicated to mostly just the last three years. Because <laughs> basically, I initially, when I wrote a book, was intending to focus primarily on the last three years, because I wanted it to be about the way that the COVID age and like the algorithmic age have emerged, and that's what I'm calling the environment age. And so basically, oh, thank you, by the way. So basically, like, I want, I want to actually do that. <laughs> and I didn't. So I, but I think it was worth it. Like, I think, because I originally, and I'll make this real quick, and then we'll get into this poem, but I originally was planning on making an academic book. And then <laughs> I realized I don't know if I want to stay in academia because it just doesn't, it's just not exactly my style the more that I think about it. And it never really has been. Um, but I love it. I do. It's given me, it gives me an opportunity to do the things that I love, but it doesn't pay me enough to live, which is, which is why I have to have a GoFundMe to live for the next two months. But anyway, the... It turned into a memoir because the all the recent research about neuroqueer self-realizations change everything. And I see that from the, being a content creator that is late in life realized autistic and non-binary and just generally neuroqueer, which is a merging of neurodiversity and queerness in any capacity. Dr. Nick Walker coined it. But anyway, basically, I was like, well... <laughs> Instead of writing an academic book, what if I just share all the secrets that I've kept for everyone for 30 years? <laughs> that could be useful. That could be, I think, maybe that could highlight exactly why people think that it's just a trend when, in fact, there's just, as all the recent research shows, lost generations of people that have suffered great extents because of substance abuse and rates of unaliving and sexual violence, all of which especially assigned female unrecognized autists and recognized autists experience at the same rate because they're still autistic, regardless of if they have a formal diagnosis. <laughs> so that's what I've tried to dedicate it to. And I think that it's what, thank you, Squirrel, I appreciate you. And also thank you for the heart and eat lesson. So anyway, this is one of the poems that I could include. I have a fuck ton about potentially being completely infatuated, infatuated with someone that, to this day, I'm not sure if I actually was, if I'm being perfectly honest. So, because I, I might have just actually, there's, so this is a little spoiler, and I promise this is the last thing I'll say before I get into reading it, but basically, I have an enormous pattern of actually just, I think, having solidarity with someone that almost certainly was just neurodivergent, and because of um, compulsive heterosexuality, I thought that I was attracted to them, I'm pretty sure, when I didn't actually want to be with them. I was just like so happy to see someone that expressed any qualities of neurodivergence that I think I mistook it because my whole life I had to pretend like I wasn't queer and that I wasn't autistic when I'm blatantly both of those things. <laughs> so, so it becomes very complicated. Anyway, this is called My Favorite Part. It got a lot of good poetry out of it either way, so that's all that really matters. <laughs> anyway, well, at least I think so at certain times. What's up, Jess? How you doing? All right, this is called My Favorite Part. And like I said, for anyone coming in, I know, right? I feel like it's a lot more relatable, especially based off of all my research that I did in my dissertation. I know that like compul compulsory heterosexuality, 
the loneliness epidemic, the sex apocalypse, the cis heteronormative orgasm gap, these are all not coincidences. They're all because we're living in a very sexually violent ecology and it's all connected. Like in, in all I really did, right? I'm not saying anything new. I just expand like our culture into like an ecological understanding and the lack of comprehensive sex education just all the forms of dehumanization combine and then especially us which isn't hasn't been known until very recently um so yeah anyway this is called my favorite part my favorite part of you is your fluidity the joy in your knowing i miss seeing exhaled tectonics of you click into place transform these blank pages in front of me there is no preparation in a product beyond life I am patterns and corners, and you are the paint I use to color in between these lines. Because obviously I'm autistic, right? <laughs> so like, uh, you know, I feel like there is definitely, I've always been the kind of person that hasn't been very expressive because I haven't been able to, because I knew I was so, I was such a soft little guy that if I let it, and it's still, like I said, it's still expressed all over my face and chest my whole fucking life. Like, I guess I wasn't doing a very good job hiding in a way that I thought that I was. And it didn't save me from, from any violences. Like, it, I mean, it, who knows, maybe to a certain extent. And as if anyone reads my memoir, especially chapter two, you'll know that one particular incident, it very well might have. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it's just a hell of a, it's a, it's a hell of a time reprocessing your whole life after realizing something that makes it all make sense in a way that just was absolutely bewildering to you for like the majority of your lifetime. It's been regaining childhood memory of how I was. Exactly, yes. Yes, 100%, Jess. 100%. And that's what's so, like, I, I'm surprising myself in the level at which I was able, or, like, I surprised myself at the level of which I was actually able to remember to write the memoir, because I wrote that memoir in, like, less than two weeks. <laughs> and I did it. I knew that I could, because I can write a fuck ton. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Remember um, when you said you won't get paid? I know, I still won't. Yeah, I know that's a good question, Victoria. <laughs> that's like, I mean, the thing is, is I'm going to have to change my schedule for lives because I'm going to be teaching after, as soon as August 28th starts is when my, the semester starts. And I literally reached out to the new, you know, problem squirrel. I reached out to the, like, union that's, like, for tenure track and tenure faculty, because I'm, like, I'm in a financial emergency. Like, <laughs> I need to be able to afford to live uh, immediately. And I can't, do because of already people's generosity, just, like, the first day after I put out a call, I might be okay, at least for the next couple weeks, hopefully, but I'm gonna be in serious trouble if I don't get thousands of dollars in the next month, like, by September 1st. I'm for sure at risk for eviction, um, but I will be working as a professor. And the reason why it's not happening is because, or, you know, the, the income isn't happening is because for anyone that doesn't know that like visiting assistant professors are like one step in like the hierarchy over adjuncts who have no health insurance and are exploited to the fullest extent that academia has to offer you if you have a PhD or not. And, um, so I was under the impression that I was not only going to not have to take 14% of my income every single month out to be put into a retirement account I did not want, because that's a requirement in the state of Ohio. And I was also under the impression that I would get paid for 12 months when in fact I was paid for nine. <laughs> so even though my department has been absolutely gracious and I can't thank them enough for letting me teach an online course this summer that allowed me to exist this month, for at least rent, um, I, I won't be able to afford to live because I switched my payment from nine months to 12 months. And for some reason, the university doesn't pay you at all, even though I'll be working over a full month until the end of September, if you do that. So it's just like completely, un it's impossible. And I just feel like both of those things would have been, they should have been told to me. Like, 
and I didn't have an option to not renew it because I need income. <laughs> like, and I love what I, I, I'm good and I love what I'm doing. Like, it's just like, yeah, it's just exhausting. Like, it's like, it just shouldn't be. And especially with like, I don't know. I just feel like I know I'm not getting paid what I deserve anyway. So it's just like a huge kick in the fucking face, if I'm honest. That I, it's just like, knowing what I know about corporate as education and the extent to which I'm not getting my needs met full time in, in all, all throughout the year is just unacceptable. Like, I do too much. And I mean, it's not like I even need to do anything to deserve what I need to live, as any of us don't. Like, we, we should just have what we need to live and thrive just because we exist. Uh, but apparently, I can't. <laughs> so it's just yeah it's just fucking it's just fucking stupid like and i hate using any word related to intelligence but truly i don't know what else to call it it is inhumane the men yeah but mm -hmm. you're in the same i know and it's so many and that's what i even said at the end of my email today to the union i was like i just know that i'm not the only first year post phd vap that's in this position there's just no way so I do media and communication, and I have been I teach public speaking. It's like the basic course. That's the thing. I'm one of the only people, and they're hiring on other new VAPs to do it because the other people that were hired on at the same time as me, one, they didn't renew their visa, and then the other one, I think, must have stepped down recently. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah, unconscionable is a good choice. That's a good point. Thank you for that squirrel. I know I have, there's like nonsensical, absurd. There's a number of things. But yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, either way, it fucking sucks. <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's get back into the, the poetry, shall we? What else did the person stalk out last night? Twinkle is just like doing the zoomies right now. She's just like, <laughs> she loves to like see little panes of light and then jump at them. You know, speaking of the way the ca colonial capitalism is making it impossible for us to live, I have one that I wrote because I met a bunch of really cool poets that actually, like, incentivized me to write poetry again, maybe, like, last year sometime. One of them is, like, a member of this collective of poets. I forget where, he, where he's located. Same twinkle, same. <laughs> But I wrote this one in like, and I, I have a difficult time writing any poetry that isn't just like written when I'm about to fall asleep. Like, cause that's how I write most everything that I've ever written, like hundreds and hundreds of poems like that. Cause they just, I don't like, I don't want to put any effort into it. I just want it to be something that happens. And I'm fortunate that that happens. <laughs> but this one I had to think of cause the purpose was no, unfortunately, I don't get disability pay. It's really hard to get on disability. And the thing is, is like, I am not formally diagnosed because a therapist told me that if I was, it would hurt me more than it would help me since I didn't know that I was autistic until I was like 29. And I was already in a PhD and doing really well. So they said, because the society is so ableist, um, I can't do it. What's up, Liz? How you doing? We're reading some poetry. But I wrote this poem anyway. And it's about exactly colonial capitalism uh, ruining our lives. <laughs> it's called The Time Machine Is Now. 2020. Thanks to COVID-19, I can feel every space between you and I. Fill in all my pockets with your empty promises. Aren't we all inflamed here burning? Twinkle is caught behind a tent in, that's behind my mirror, and she's being a little goofy, little kitty right now. <laughs> I don't know if she's stuck or what. Anyway, 2025. I am the imperfect academic vertebrate, a bird of culture and war song. Touch my chirps and breed with me. Hoop up with my flock of feathered intellectuals. I lay in my nest, the living leftist dinosaur. Prophet dug up all the bones of my dead lovers. I don't, or I didn't diversify dramatically for this. 
2030. <laughs> she's, so, she's so fucking goofy, y'all. I'm sorry, it's distracting. Here we are, laid down dead for elite consumption. Too late to live a life rich in more than raw materials. Our ancestors processed in domestication. We, the worker bees, unprovoked by songs of our own survival. We, so sure we could subside on entertainment at the low cost of eco-terror. We could have stopped this. What happens when our sky, priced out, collapses and falls down? So yeah, fuck billionaires. <laughs> also, thanks for sharing the live. So it would hurt me. So that's a really good question, Victoria. So basically, because <laughs> the answer is complicated. I've made some videos about this that expand on it. But basically, because I've gone my entire life not being diagnosed and how ableist the world is, and with fascism returning in an incredibly eugenics context that hates anyone racialized non-white anyone disabled anyone that is considered a lesser human across the board which obviously the most of us have been in different ways a therapist told me that because i've survived to the point that i have and um now know i wouldn't it would hurt me more than it would help me because the world is so discriminatory and systematically hates autistic people so if i was to get a diagnosis because of the level of education I've attained and because of the privileges and accomplishments that I've had, they told me that I would be delegitimating myself in a world that hates people like me. And they already do. Well, like, <laughs> I'm already risking everything by sharing my memoir and I know that. I risk everything by making all the content I do and I know that. But I know that I represent an enormous amount of people lost generations that haven't been able to be recognized because the criteria failed us. So that's how it would hurt me. It would hurt me because I wouldn't be able to go to other countries if I needed to flee. Not that I can afford to, but many countries don't allow autistic people to come in because they see us as less than human. They objectify us, they dehumanize us, they sexualize us, and they don't allow us to have any of the full humanity that other people are afforded because they have a really reductive idea of what it means to be autistic and that's why we've all been missed in the first place but they don't know that and many especially psychologists are dedicated to building their entire lives work to make our lives living hells infantilized thank you <laughs> ed knows my scripts at this point so I knew I knew there was one of them I forgot did I say dehumanize twice I think I remember that saying the list and knowing I needed to include that. And if I forgot that, thank you. <laughs> All right. What else we got here? Yeah, that's a short answer. I got, there's a lot more to say about it though. But yeah, that's why like anyone else besides, and even not all young white cis boys were diagnosed autistic. I have, I have a PhD. I've been to a lot of college, <laughs> an incredible amount, more than I ever thought I would. Okay, I don't think I read the meaning of Lucian. Oh, did I? Maybe I, I didn't publish this one. Maybe it's just not going to find it because there's too many words. Yeah, there we go. All right. So, for anyone that doesn't know, the part at the end, I always forget, is it the suffix? The end of a... The ending part of a word, if it ends in lation, like, you know, dash, L-A-T-I-O-N, 
It means the purpose underlying or intended by speech, action, etc. The inner symbolic or true interpretation, value, or message, the meaning of a dream. So I saw that. I forget what inspired me to do this at all, but the poem goes like this. <laughs> I paint each of my fingers a unique color. They each click forward, alone, their own idea. Typing is my coordinated stimulation. Each of our fingers reflecting another. All things mirrored, halved, and flipped. So obviously, words. Autistic words. <laughs> Autistic words who like to write. <laughs> I read another one recently about the earth. It's just on the front page. Like over there. I just meant that I don't have much like of a explanation for that. It just kind of happened and I liked how it sounded. <laughs> All right, this one is called The Earth. The earth only signs the feeling of earthquakes. Rivers damned so dry landed, they had forgotten what hydrated even means. Damned and found. So used to mild disgust and disappointments. A solid rock made to hold everyone else up. You cannot live as an anchor and not be used for your purpose. When the stress on the edge overcomes the friction, only earth signs know the uncontainable feeling of an earthquake. What's up, Nolan Nation? I'm reading all my old poetry. Some of it, this one's, like I said, this is literally the newest one I've written. When did I write that? May of this year. On the 29th, to be exact. <laughs> but somebody last night stocked out all my poetry, and I don't know who it was, but they stocked out quite a bit of it, and I decided I was going to read the ones that they reminded me exist. <laughs> by looking at them. That's all good. College is fucking rough. It's rough. I never particularly, like, I write about this in my memoir. I had, like, a 2.6 throughout most education. And, um, I definitely have difficulty re learning too much at the same time. But I'm not sure. I had the the thing about me is is I had to pretend that I didn't that I wasn't autistic for most of my life, and apparently I was able to do that enough to skate by. And I, in in my early life, realized I wasn't supposed to be smart, so then I stopped trying, <laughs> and uh, then I learned a lot about other things that weren't in school, like just existing and having to you know survive as a a masked autist in a world that hates us. Uh, and then I basically realized that communication was a field and I could study it and that people can get paid for it potentially. <laughs> and I knew that if there was one thing that I was going to do with my life, I needed to do everything I possibly could to do that. And so my bachelor's, I basically scheduled myself like half time for six and a half years. Because uh, I couldn't handle the actual workload of, like, the five classes. But I didn't know that at the time. I just scheduled myself and did whatever I want. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do with the bachelor's in sociology. So as long as it took, I was like, that's fine. So anyway, I got lucky. And if you want to read more, it's in my memoir. <laughs> I got incredibly lucky. Like, for all intents and purposes, I should not have a PhD right now. But... Here we are. Because <laughs> I, my favorite things were what I studied in, 
in my graduate courses that I, I got lucky to have signed up for. So it all just worked out exactly in the way that allowed me to get one. But if there was anything else that happened, I wouldn't have one by any means. <laughs> it's just, it was a, a miraculous set of incidences that allowed me to somehow. And yeah, I don't know. It's so I'm very, which is to say I'm a, I'm a very untraditional academic for that because I wasn't like prime from birth and I probably do have difficulties in learning that I'm not aware of because I've had to con convince myself I don't have them and then I did a convincing enough job to for people to not notice <laughs> like which is like I don't know if that's good or bad but whatever it is what it is oh what's up BJ oh yeah I know yeah that good I'm glad that you do I mean, I'm sorry. I, you know, whenever I say, like I said the other day, like the first when I read chapter, like the intro and in chapter one of my memoir, I wish I could have put like a, a thing at the top of each page that's just like, I'm so sorry if you relate to this. Because <laughs> honestly, it's, it was not, it was not a good, I was straight up having a bad time for the first 30 years of my life. Um, so if you relate to it, I'm very sorry. But also that's what makes it important, you know? All right, let's let's read one from my early 20s, shall we? <laughs> All right, this one's called Remember. Remember when I wrote you that note? Your grandpa had just died. You were destroyed. You didn't want to see me then. That's when I knew, but I still hand wrote you that note anyway, in purple ink. It was an extended list of compliments. You could never take a compliment. Your singing voice and how badly you want to make something with your hands. How the first time I was over, as I left, you said, am I ever going to see you again? And then one day, after years and years, you didn't deserve to keep it anymore to occasionally read as a reminder. So I stole it back from your special box. It lives in mine now. So for anyone that's already read the memoir, you might already know what person in my 20s that was about. Because <laughs> I, I referred to exactly one part in it, I forget which. The, the question they asked me at the door. The first time I was ever over. Oh, oh all the undeserved notes. <laughs> right, yeah. That was like one of the first times I feel like I ever did that. And that was like a very like stereotypically like millennial seventh grade thing to do. But... I did it in my early 20s, so it is what it is. And I don't regret it stealing it back. <laughs> I think that it was important for me too. And like I said, if you read that, you'll know why. <laughs> yeah, mixtapes, exactly, yes, yes, yes. Here's another one. This is like another one of, that I wrote in early years of pandemic and it's another one where i wasn't sure if i actually am in love with the person <laughs> or ever was um or if i was just really into the fact that i noticed that they were autistic or had, had traits that they're autistic but i'll never know only they will <laughs> so yeah that's understandable victoria they make a lot of stuff super dense that's the difficulty about reading anything academic, because usually it's like they lose sight of like how confusing a lot of what they have to say is. And that's been something that I, I've like really cherished about like just being on platforms more. Because I've been, I mean, especially as like a hyperlexic person with stilted speech, I like am really thankful for people who have been like, Hey, Bird, um, what do you mean? 
because I'll just throw all the meaning into a single sentence and then I think that people are following but they may have no fucking idea what I'm talking about and I need you to ask me questions if that happens please because I won't know because I know what I know <laughs> and then I lose sight of what other people don't know and you know we can never know what other people know so I never try to presume I just you know I because so much of my life I've spent being treated like I was arrogant or like I am a know-it-all or whatever because I'm a PDA profile autist and that's like one of the trademark signs. I go out of my way in, in ways that I think are effective to try to talk to people as if they already know what I'm talking about because if I talk to them as if I think that they don't know what they're talking about, I've been treated like an asshole. So I, I feel like it's less, like I get less shit if I talk to people as if I don't know what they're talking about. So it's kind of a lose-lose. Like, because <laughs> it's like, either I think that people know, and then I'm failing them because they don't, or I talk to them as if they don't know, and then they don't like me because I'm, like, treated as, like, an arrogant piece of shit. And I'm like, okay, great. Like, what what can I do? What am I supposed to do here? <laughs> like, I don't know. I can't change. But it's, yeah, it's been, it made it harder not knowing I was autistic to understand the difficulties, especially I have so many social and communication difficulties that I had convinced myself don't exist, like I talked about in that TikTok the other day. Yeah, and for those of us who are taught to never ask questions, it helps us too. Exactly. Okay, good. Well, hell yeah, good. I'm glad that I make you feel like that. Because I, like I said, it sucks. I want, to, I want people to know what I'm talking about. I want people to, like, feel comfortable to ask questions if they have them. So, good. All right, like I said, we got, we got this next one. Early years of pandemic, I think. Let me see. 2022. So this is pretty, this is like one of the more recent ones, I guess. So this is called Lucky for Me, I Remembered. I am fully in love with you. <laughs> and it goes like this. Let me curl up into your hand and fall asleep. I see all that space there inside your palm. This bed is much too big for one little me. Lover, read me in silence before drifting off to never, never lands. That's about someone I thought was stalking out my blog. <laughs> but I didn't know if it was actually them. But I, I have a pretty good hunch that it was. That's what that's about. Well, like I said, I don't even know if I actually ever had feelings for them. Or if maybe I was just playing out the the good old heterosexuality. Cis -hetero, compulsory cis heterosexuality. Because as someone that has alexithymia and hyperempathy and interoception issues, it's hard, like I talked about in one of the first poetry nights I think I ever did on here, it's hard for me to know what I'm feeling at any given time. I just know that I'm feeling a lot if I feel it, because I only can tell that I'm feeling anything if it reaches about a 9 out of 10. <laughs> so, odds are good not knowing I was autistic, and then constantly being triggered because my fight or flight is triggered by basic demands, and basic demands like being a social person in public, uh, there's a good chance that I was never actually attracted to the people that I thought I was, and in fact was just incredibly either uncomfortable or intimidated or anxious or playing out some sort of compulsory heterosexuality that I had become accustomed to. So it becomes very complicated. And that's the kind of shit that I would expand on in the second memoir if I write it, which I, I basically plan to at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Yeah, you gotta have grace with yourself. That's good advice, Ed. As always. All right, what else did this person stock out? I keep accidentally going to the WordPress site, and then remember I said it doesn't have the stats anymore, so I can't see. Okay, I got this one called Infinity Cube. Do y'all know what an Infinity Cube is? It's like a, it's a stem toy. In fact, I had it in a TikTok Live. It was probably months ago at this point. But it's one of my favorites. And if you imagine, it almost looks like a Rubik's Cube. We could just Google it.
best toy for fidgeting. Yeah, this is exactly the one that I have. So this is, for anyone that's on TikTok, this is what an infinity cube is. And basically, this cube, as you can see, enlarged. <laughs> it opens up, and then it just does just like this. And you can open it and close it infinitely. Okay? And it's one of my favorite things because it is just very, like, it's just very satisfying. So anyway, that's what this is uh, named. <laughs> Let me click over. And it goes like this. I want to undo and redo you with one hand. To spread you back on yourself like an infinity cube. To know you like the back and the front. To feel and watch your parts pull apart and fall together like collapsible chair. Four words, ad infinitum. Your groove or your fixed grooves allow only certain angles of movement. And I know better now than to force what doesn't open willingly. So for oh you're all you're all wonky. Let me let me fix you up. <laughs> On TikTok at least. So like I guess the part that I forgot to mention that I refer to at the end in a different way is like an infinity cube. It only like you can only either open it forward or open it backward. And that the concept of what is forward and backward is totally made up because it's just a fucking cube, you know? But you can't turn it any other way but two ways. Or no, you can open it a couple ways, I think. But it's got fixed grooves. <laughs> so that's what I'm talking about. What else we got? Oh, I wrote another. So there's another one that I wrote. When I was doing poetry on that all audio app clubhouse, it's called Bello. This was the first poem I ever wrote about being Roma. So like I said, it's called Bello. They handed us gypsies to their white clay bowl, shrunk us down, sat us all inside, cold, and said, this is who you have always been. We too knew better. We are the geysers. We are life ascending. Darks, grays, tans in bloom. We rise up into ourselves. They didn't calculate. Our wombs only know to create freely. We breathe in truths. Mask ourselves from their lies. We fill ourselves uncontainable lives, bellowing outside cold ceramic. I wrote this on my birthday <laughs> a year ago. I forgot that it was my birthday. That was when I wrote this. But the image, I don't remember if I made the image first or if I made the image second. But this is, like, the picture that I think fit really well with it. And like I said, it's AI. I think it does a pretty decent job of the imagery. <laughs> I know, and that's the thing, right? It's, like, it's so, it's unacceptable that, like, there's so many people who have just been missed when they could have gotten help. Like, that's what I, and I forgot to say this before, so I'm glad that you said that, Victoria, because only, like, every individual person knows if they should or shouldn't get a formal diagnosis. Like, I, the, the reason why I, it would hurt me more than it would help me is because I have enough privilege, and I don't know if I would be considered a quote-unquote level one or a level two, but I know that, obviously, I 
in many ways there's no way you know since autistic people aren't a hive mind it's like a very you know it's a neurodiverse group in itself among other neurodiversities i'm an incredibly privileged autist like and that's why i was able to even mask in the first place because there's plenty of autists obviously that don't they can't mask and i but the thing is is like i i wrote about in my memoir like i there's times in my life where i've teetered between like masking and not masking because i either like was so burned out from it or i just you know if you don't know you're autistic and you just are living your life it's easy to have your mask fall off every once in a while because you're just being who you are you don't know that you're having to hide like it's like you're hiding but you don't know you're hiding like <laughs> but you do but you don't like it's like it's an absolute mind fuck um yeah and that's so common victoria exactly yeah and that's so many people and it's like that's how that's why like what the way that autism has been understood has failed so many people and it's hard enough even for people that have like in exceptional privilege that are autistic to be seen as like actually autistic which is what makes it so important that we share our experiences especially if we meet the criteria that exists now, but have just been missed because we don't look the type, allegedly. Even though it literally explains our entire lives to a T <laughs> in a way that we've had to hide because the world would have discriminated against us more. So. What else I got here? I forget if I like this one. I would try to reach out. There should be like, you know, I don't know what kind of campus you're on, but there should be like some sort of resources. But I know it's difficult because I've been on both sides of the class, you know, before. Like I, I teach college classes, but then also... I've been a student and I know that it's hard to get accommodations if you don't have a formal diagnosis. That's why I make sure now, like in the ever since finishing my PhD and learning more about what it means to like get access to accommodations, I make sure that if a student does or doesn't have a formal diagnosis, that I put something in my syllabus that says, come and talk to me anyway, and I'll make sure that you get accommodations. So, but I know that the vast majority of professors don't know anything about disabilities and they end up reinforcing things that are harmful to people that need them. So, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of instructors don't know what's best for their students at the end of the day because they're just humans and they only know what they know. All right, this one is about um, the same thing. Because <laughs> I read a lot about it. So it's called Are We? Like I said, early years of COVID. It goes like this. Are we removed enough for you? Have you found comfort in our laps of ones and zeros? Block me, baby. Spread me across the stratosphere. To find me is to tentatively crush upon many discomforting what-ifs. Oh, boo-hoo, too challenging. You need me forgettable. You couldn't handle this B-switch. And then I have the song by Say Anything. Let me play it, because I think it'll probably be important. I forget it. Get down to it. Get down to it. It's called Bye Tonight. I fucking love saying anything. Enjoy so So good. I love every say anything song basically. I a lot of my poems I put like a little bit of a song at the end. And somehow it ends up usually like the clip that it chooses, which I don't get to pick, by the way. It's just like whatever like Spotify wants. 
<laughs> I've usually really liked the piece that it chooses. It's like an accompaniment. Oh, for sure. I know, and that's the thing, Victoria. It's like, there's so many people who, like, have needed so much more support than they re than anyone realized. And it's, like, that's the thing about, like, educational structures, just, like, broadly, is, like... Obviously, anyone that runs any kind of, like, K-12 through education, like, kindergarten through high school, like, they also only knew what they knew, but the thing is, is, like, it doesn't make it any less tragic to know how many people have been passed along with things that they could have, like, that if people noticed they needed assistance, they could have been supported, you know? So... It just goes to show, like, how ill-fit the current education system really is to, like, assist people in the way that they actually have always deserved and what they've needed. And it's not that we don't have the capacity to do it. It's just if the things that tell if someone is or isn't someone that needs assistance don't properly identify who does, like, there's no chance in someone being able to get help that they need. And that's unfortunately what we're experiencing in, like, a really big way. And that's why so many people that are in psychology or are in education, all you know, they're so afraid to acknowledge the fact that so many more people that have, like, or need any kind of diagnosis or assistance, that's why, in large part, they're concerned about people acknowledging a more diverse concept of autism because if they admit that they've always missed the vast majority of us that means that they've failed the one job that they had in a in a huge way and if the amount of of the the stat shows haven't been diagnosed which by the way is 80 percent upwards of 80 percent of assigned female at birth people that are autistic by the age of 18 they estimate are you know missed and aren't formally diagnosed that means millions if not billions of people have been missed and we've been thinking that autistic people aren't the norm in a in a diverse neurotype world and we've been missed and we've suffered the consequences of being missed so it's hard for i think a lot of people whose entire job it was to catch us it's hard for them to admit that they've failed us because it means that they've made us suffer so much in ways that we could have not suffered if they would have just known. But it was such a much, it's such a bigger problem than just anyone alive today, because this is like hundreds of years, if not thousands of years in the making. But what's important is now we do know, and that's why psychologists and anyone in education needs to take it seriously, because knowing what we know now, it changes everything. Like, it truly does. It changes everything about how we should be handling education. It changes everything about the way that diagnosis should be. It changes everything about the way that, like, any kind of barriers to getting accommodation should be handled. It changes everything we know about relationships and identity. It's like, it literally, it touches every single facet of everything. Because if, you, if your concept of who is like how a human brain works is not including autistic people. And we know that autistic people are now infinitely more common than once thought. That's a problem. My suggestion, so I had, there's a website that I give my students and it's called, I think it's called the JAN Network, Jobs Accommodations Network. So it's J-A-N.com. And that's what I usually give students if they don't have any kind of formal diagnosis to look at. Because even though it's for people that are not students, or at least it's for a, like working a job rather than being a student, which is technically a different job, <laughs> um, it allows you to look to see what kind of needs you might have and what kind of like accommodations you might ask for. Or you might be able to um, get help in other ways from other people. I think that's probably what I would recommend. But realistically, I think... 
I mean, I can't, unfortunately, I can't tell you what's going to be most beneficial to you because our experiences, I think, are so different that I don't think I have any kind of expertise in being able to help you and know. But I know that there are other people that are, especially other autistic people that know a lot more about autism broadly than me. I think it might be, yeah, maybe they changed their website. Let me see, let's see. I think it might just be Jan Network. Oops. Java comment, yeah, ask, yeah, that's all right. Mm -hmm. Yep, this one. Yep. So you can basically just like go through and it can you so you can search just for like accommodations yeah that's right mm -hmm. and then you can like select a different accommodation that you might need so probably just like search through here that's usually what i recommend my students to do and there's a whole bunch of stuff like there's so much more than i would have ever guessed <laughs> so and it's because obviously there's i mean disabilities are like really really common and people don't talk about them like they are they're like super diverse. There's a lot of things that people might need assistance with, and there's lots of things that we can do. So yeah, take a look at that for sure, and then see, and then maybe um, that can give you some idea. That's for sure the best resource that I've seen that, and my students have, you know, they've talked to me about it after I asked them to go look at it, and they said that like it was impressive. So I've had some luck with it. All right, what else we got here? What else did I write years ago? Oh yeah, this one. I don't really like the AI picture that this one came with or that this one, that the AI created for me with this one. It's not my favorite, but it's a, I like the piece to an extent. It's called Loving You. Loving you is like being born without teeth. <laughs> as natural as breathing. I am a volcano, ruptured and cooling. Walk along my ash. I form islands. If you come here, I could be your paradise. Oh, that's another one that I didn't write all that long ago. Time is so elusive in the last three years that I, I feel like I wrote that way far, like way, way long ago, but it was actually just like last year. <laughs> so that's, that's surprising even to me. What else did I write? Yeah, just, I think, let me see. I bet probably, well, you know what? I'd be able to look and see at my, present COVID words. So I, these are just all the poems that I wrote since COVID started. <laughs> it's a lot. They're all short, just like the ones that I've been reading, but it's a pretty decent amount of poems to write for like someone as who just writes when they're drifting off to sleep. And this is like, I, I mean, Is that only even, yeah, that, this was the last one that I had in the little menu. So I also wrote four, 10 more. I think I, I think this is another one that they stocked out. Oh yeah, this one's kind of cheesy, <laughs> but it's another one about the planet. In fact, I think I read this on TikTok once. It's called, you know, you know, the planet, she called me crying. She said they were good Christian men, the ones who did this to her. Can't blame him for how he was raised. He isn't really like that. He meant well. He was abused by his founding fathers, too. He gives it like he took it. How to be a man? Silly me. I'm sure you've heard this one before. 
hundreds of years of white cis maleness, how could anyone forget this sick legacy? Romanticized genocides, gunmen, murderers, vigilantes, terrorists, abusers, rapists, and pedophiles. Enough about him. So many forever chemicals in Earth's veins, no question she's the heroine. Slow breath, mass death, brain disabling humanity. Land of the fee, blood sports can't even die for free. And then this is what the AI created. <laughs> I really like the AI pictures that it came with. I didn't, I don't remember what I typed in. Like, I think I might have, I, I think I might have pasted the middle part. And that's what it came up with. There's an option on Night Cafe to have like hyper realistic faces. And I'm pretty sure that's the option I went with. I think it did a pretty good job. <laughs> that's the closest one I've ever written to like bars. <laughs> Which I was pretty I was pretty proud of, if I'm being honest. There's another one that's got the same kind of vibe. I forget if I put it... I think I might have put it in my... chat book. Let me see. So I have like eight chat books of poems, like I said at the beginning of the live. I have like eight chat books of poems that have just been... I've not been promoting. <laughs> I published them in like 2021 and I just finally put all of them on Kindle Unlimited so now I can actually access my own poetry books for free because <laughs> hilariously if you publish any poetry books on Kindle if you, you can't see the copy that anyone else can see unless you pay for your own poetry book even though you upload the file for it to be there I like to have it look like an actual Kindle so I want to look at the Kindle version and apparently it it doesn't let you do that if um i gotta open up kindle i think it doesn't let you do that unless you buy your own book which is like hilariously ridiculous if you ask me so i'm opening up my kindle so we can read this one that i'm thinking of because there's a line in my memoir that i took from one particular poem from my chat book that was about losing my mom Oh, that's the last one. Where are we at? I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up on Twitch in just a moment. I just gotta remember which one it is. I'm pretty sure this it's in here at least. Maybe it's not. You know what? Maybe yeah. Maybe it is on my poetry book. Oop, oh no. I have this habit of accidentally like maximizing a window when I should be just minimizing it. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Oh yeah, this is it. I'm surprised I didn't put this into the book, actually. Okay, so this one's called I Was a Baby. I might have read it already once on Poetry Night, but it's exactly, I wrote it, the line that I like the most from it, into my memoir when I was describing my mom. But it goes like this. I was a baby crying for my mother without her coming to soothe me long before she had passed away. When I was a child, I had terrible, reoccurring, and very vivid nightmares. I would wake up wailing and sobbing from lingering terror and she consoled my demons away. Everything I know about loving others, I learned from her loving past me in ways I took for granted. Her love, like her cooking, was always a bit too spicy and oily for a delicate palate. My mother did the best that she could with what she was given, and what she was given was poison to death. In life, my mom was certain we would one day win the lottery. She ended hers, legally, profitably, and power ballsy. Contrary to McLuhan's sentiments, ads are good or ads are news 
What is wrong with them is that they are always good news. Mesothelioma, I can never say this word, mesothelioma commercials aren't all good news for living children of the dead. So Marshall McLuhan is like the big old canon figure of media ecology. And I had a very different perspective on that quote of his. <laughs> ever since uh, my mom passed, because in the United States, your companies can poison your loved ones to death for profit and then give you blood money in place of their lives as if that is acceptable. And I saw, like, I don't remember if I wrote that after I, I saw the first mesothelioma commercial after she passed away from it, or if it was a while after, but I think that like much of what McLuhan said, it can have many different meanings that may go against his very bold claims that oftentimes I enjoy, but in this case, I think I can contest. There's more to the story. <laughs> but yeah, the line about she did the best that she could with what she was given and what she was given was poisoned to death. I put that in my memoir. What else we got here? Oh, thank you for the hand hearts, JB. Oh, all the hand hearts. Thank you for that. Oh, wow. How many? Thank you. <laughs> they just all the hand hearts, they just keep coming. There was one time when I was on a live and I think that the hand hearts glitched out because there was like, I'm not even kidding. There was a hysterical amount of hand hearts being sent in rapid succession. Like I'm talking like hundreds of them. Like the hand hearts were being sent for like a good straight actual five minutes. And the person was like, I got them on sale. And I was like, this just has, like I was actually just absolutely dying. I was hysterically laughing because it was one of those things where like it feel it felt like they should have ended and then they just kept going and I was like, what the fuck? Like it was just so generous that I was like, how? How did you buy this? Like, cause you would have had this. I mean, just for that amount, like I know that TikTok already overprices shit. So like even if it was on sale to send like this a hundred amount of like fucking hand hearts, it had to have at least been like a hundred bucks. And I've surely I think I only got like I got like 15 cents, so there's no way that it wasn't just like an animation glitch that we got to like take advantage of once, and it was just, I don't know, it was hysterical. I'll, I'll remember that forever. Oh, there's, okay, I remember another one. I think I didn't read this one already. <laughs> the next one call is called, You Had the Nerve. <laughs> Again, another one about someone who I may or may not have met or had feelings for, but was convinced that I did. <laughs> it goes like this. You had the nerve to point your mirror at me, and I shattered into sharp digital crystals. Did I ever tell you I can be a weapon or tool? Densely packed composites from sands of time, poured over myself reflective. Watch me glisten back now toward any deflection. So that's a little ditty about getting told off and then bursting into a bunch of pixels and then and then and then revisiting your whole life. <laughs> Not that I would I would ever like, uh, you know resume with that, but I certainly wrote it down somehow. Quite the coincidence.
that song, like, it's just, it's so good. Like, it's like both, it's like somehow they've made existentialism approachable. And it always is, you know, but like, I feel like a lot of people don't think about that kind of stuff in like mainstream music kind of way. But maybe, I mean, there's, there's definitely a turn if, if there hasn't, because that song is a fucking masterpiece. Like, holy shit. The sound is very used. Like, what else we got here? Let me see if I like any of the old ones. Because <laughs> there's a good chance. I Like I said, I'm not a fan of a lot of my older poetry. When I was like 26, 27. I think I like this one. I think I published this one. I forgot. Oh, yeah, I must have because it's not available. Unless it just doesn't want to show because it's broken. Yeah, I must have drafted that one because I think I got it published. I didn't realize it stays in this little area if I publish it and I put it in the drafts. Gotta fix that. I think I published this one too. Just an emoji. An emoji with no facial expressions. Hmm. This is very early pandemic of me. So this one, <laughs> anyone knows I like a really overused bad pun. This one is called Pan Men Ick. Incredibly cheesy, but I'm here for it. <laughs> it goes like this. Each of my past lovers was my own personal pandemic. They separated me from my loved ones, locked me indoors away from any other dangers. Social distance doesn't come easy now. I mask up in order to protect others from my emotional scars. I stay indoors away from those who I may inadvertently make sick. That was a 2021 one, and early, in fact, February 11th. Snake a pillar. <laughs> What's that? What, how you doing, Will? There's a, uh, some, I like one of my, it's like the shortest poem I think I've ever written. It's just called Now. It just goes, you are me, or now. Because <laughs> I like to have my poem titles be in the poem themselves. Now you are merely another little man who wrongly thought he could speak down to me. <laughs> and this is the image. <laughs> That's awesome. Don't blame me for this image. AI made this. <laughs> That's a good poem image. Thank you. <laughs> and it's just these two senses. Well, you can't see on TikTok, I guess. <laughs> All right, I think I'm going to read one more. Um, we're gonna close early because I'm poemed out <laughs> it's called 11 11 11 this is another one that will make infinitely more sense if you read my memoir the unluckiest day of my 21 year old life I was working at Spencer's Gifts then and if that wasn't bad enough, I was wearing a fedora to a pre-release of Elder Scrolls Skyrim alone. I arrived to the game shop line forming outside. 
I remember the air, a thick mixture of BO and fantastical gaming anticipation. And that douchebag we both hate in our own ways, picking at the bare, at the nearly bare carcass of a rotisserie chicken in that line against the wall. There on the pavement where we met, I didn't give a single fuck about you then. If only it stayed that way. <laughs> I wrote that in 2017. Rotisserie chickens have been good. I haven't, I don't eat any animal products and I haven't for like 14 years, but rotisserie chickens are good. Like that's, I remember that being a distinctly, inarguably good thing. Yeah, Spencer's Gifts was cool, but I worked there when I was 21 and it got really old working there. You know, like all the charm of the store very much dissipates if you work there. <laughs> That's just how it goes. Yeah. It's like, what can you do, you know? You, you go anywhere too much, you spend too much time with anything, and eventually it'll, you know, lose its charm. I know, yeah, fair enough. I don't think, I don't think I've been, no, I've been in one since. It feels weird going back in one. Because they all basically look the same. I haven't really, I don't remember the last time I was even at a mall, to be honest. So I haven't been to a Spencer's in quite a long time. It might have, it must have been. I haven't been to a mall since starting my PhD. Which is, wow. I also haven't, like, been inside of a grocery store <laughs> in literally, like, three years. Because my one non-negotiable accommodation is to have groceries delivered, because the grocery store is a sensory nightmare. Oh, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> See, like, when I worked there, it was, like, around the time when I already had, like, a bunch of piercings, and I had super cool hair. And... Everyone would just, like, I mean, you know, Spencer's has, like, a whole bunch of sexist shirts. And, what's up, Christiana? How you doing? <laughs> I was about to jump off, but I was reading poetry. So if you want to check that out, it'll be on my YouTube. I'm going to export the video into my Dr. Bird on Twitch folder. <laughs> yeah, the worst shirts. And it was, like, when I was still, like, not a good person. So I, but it was still, like, you know, I was, like, the beginning... I was, it was before more of my worst trauma, but it was, like, right there, you know? Like, so, yeah, it was a time in my life where I was drinking heavily. And then that was also the point in time when those wristbands were popular. Yeah, I know, neither, I can't buy any shirts with words either, so I like that you said that, because, like, it makes me feel some type of way I can't explain. Like, it just feels like I would be regressing. I don't know. Even if it's something that, like, has a good message, it just feels... Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, I have the exact same feeling, and I can't quite describe why. But I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> But yeah, and then, like I said, they would just, that was when, like, the crowds of kids would come in, and then they would seal. Yeah, I don't know why. It's, like, in a way that I can't quite, it's because I've been wearing them since I was, like, 11. It's kind of like if I was to wear, like, a zip-up hoodie that looked like an emo kid. Like, I feel like I would be, like, I'm too old. I know, yeah. Well, but it's funny, like, don't get me wrong, like, I think I they still look fine on other people a lot of the time, also. I just feel like I can't do it. It just doesn't fit me anymore. Yeah, hoodie, yeah. Well, and it's like, I can wear, like, other hoodies. I just can't, for some reason, wear, like, a zip-up. Because that was, like, a very distinct... That was just a very distinct me thing. That was, like, all I would wear. Like, I'm not even kidding. I would have- I had probably, like, 25 hoodies that were, like, specifically, like, zip-ups. 
when I was an emo kid. Because, duh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So they would steal all the wristbands, and we, we didn't stand a chance against them. It was like hordes of kids that would just go around the wristband box, like the, the wristband buckets. And then there would just be all the little tiny tags littered everywhere. And then... Emo is not a phase. That's a good point, Ed. <laughs> emo is life. I'm still emo, obviously. Like, <laughs> emo is life. That's true. I still definitely love, I mean, what, we just listened to that Say Anything song. Like, just, just, just a few minutes ago. It still has a very special place in my heart. What's up, Harley? But yeah, so that, and then, um, they would always come in and like make jokes about the the sex sack and i was like it was funny at the beginning but eventually it was just like can you not touch them you know people are going to do stuff with that right like can you not be just a totally inconsiderate human please thank you well, like <laughs> or like we were one of the stores this is actually the part that upset me the most by far oh did you hell yeah thank you for doing that harley let me know what you think of it okay But we were like the, we were the Spencers because they're, you know, like franchises usually have like a certain store and what they'll do is like they send all of their newest like shirts to that particular store to like test them out. And we were that Spencers. So like the thing about that is, is like, you know how Spencer's shirts were always like 20 bucks. Oh, hey, thank you. I know. I hope that people liked that. I feel like it would, it probably made a lot more sense to see how I read it, even though I tried to do my best to, like, italicize and bold to, like, and, and capitalize to exemplify my, like, specific personality and writing voice, so hopefully that, like, that speaks for itself, but I don't know. But, yeah, like, it was just, it was a weird time, because they would, if they, if the shirts that were new that they were testing out didn't sell well, they would literally have us destroy them. And these shirts were like $20 each. And there's people that like need clothing. So I felt like me and one of the managers once, who was my favorite manager by far, she was awesome. We, instead of destroying them, cause they literally made us just, you know, like other grocery stores do all the time, like other kinds of companies, they do this constantly where they throw away totally perfectly good new shit that other people didn't buy because they don't want to like lose money and so they can't just like give it away they literally prefer and choose to destroy perfectly good shit instead of giving it to someone that needs it so they literally would like ask us to destroy just cut up these t-shirts and then throw them in a dumpster and one day we were like no like <laughs> we're not gonna do that anymore and so there was just these bags because it's not like there's anyone like Big Brother isn't in the back of a Spencer's checking to see if you cut up the t-shirts and didn't steal them. <laughs> like, yeah. So that's what we did. <laughs> but only, you know, allegedly in Minecraft, obviously. This is a joke. We didn't do that. We totally destroyed them. And we, we didn't take them home. <laughs> Those things are garbage. They're in a landfill. Don't you worry, big brother. We trashed the perfectly good items and then we threw them away. Just like is just like is most profitable. We contributed to the, the Great Pacific garbage patch of specifically Spencer's t-shirts. <laughs> exactly, yes. In Minecraft. It just sucks. Like, it's bad enough. Just those t-shirts. Like, the amount of t-shirts that we, we did that with. But it's, like, so much worse, right? When it's, like, food. Like, food that, like, actually isn't not edible. And people are hungry. Like, that. that's what I'm always talking Like, there's so many instances throughout my life that I talk about in the memoir where I'm like, this radicalized me, this radicalized me, this radicalized me, this radicalized me. Like, this showed me how useless and made-up money is. Because if people just give out money for no fucking reason... Which goes to show how in unserious the economy actually is. Well, many people have, are living lives where their vicinity was deliberately underdeveloped by Europe. <laughs> mm 
while while people in their 20s can just talk to people meanly and they'll be handed hundreds if not thousands of dollars for doing it for no fucking reason like are you kidding me like you can't tell me that the economy is real if that's how it works don't tell me that the world means anything or that meritocracy exists if this is how it fucking works like <laughs> it's just there's this and that's why, you know, that's why I wrote it, too, because I was like, I know that putting that in there and I'm, you know, I can't say it on, on the TikTok, but there's just too many things that I've lived where I'm like, this is bullshit. <laughs> this this delegitimizes any kind of seriousness that anyone could possibly believe in the current structure. Like, <laughs> it's just as if we need any more reasons. There was somebody I saw earlier on Twitter. <laughs> And I know that there's, like, a fuck ton of people that just, like, they're lackeys for, like, some sort of larger corporation. But they're, like, they're young enough to, like, not know better, probably. They're just, like, a mouthpiece that, like, was raised into immediately being someone in the alt-right. And so they go around saying shit that's just, like, overtly inaccurate and propaganda. And I wonder if after I end this live, I'm gonna look at the Twitter and see if they were upset. But... There's a person who's like, literally, they said on their profile that they're 20 years old. And they, <laughs> they said that, they said in, in the near future, there's going to be basically like, we're going to be financially thriving. It's going to be an unprecedented growth. And we're to the likes that no one has ever seen. And I tweeted at them. I forget what I was doing. It was like, I think I was about to leave to go pick up my food share. And I was like, oh, wow, can I see the crystal ball that you look into and then can to see the future so I can look into it, too, and then say stuff that's absolute fucking nonsense? <laughs> but it's like a part of me knows that, like, it's just like, OK, like they're getting their back and they've been heavily propagandized. So either they do believe in what they said or they don't. But either way, it's wrong and it's bullshit. And even though they may or may not know better, it's unacceptable and it shouldn't be tolerated. Because either they're caving and, and just overtly spreading disinformation, or they're young and naive and being exploited by a system that wants them to do that. And either way, it's wrong. <laughs> but it's, it wasn't the most mature thing for me to do, but I, I don't regret it. And that's what came to mind. They need ointment for that burn. Exactly, yeah. Let me see. There was some, I said some other stuff after, like just my usual spiel. Like the, like, because <laughs> every five minutes, I'm basically just like, colonial capitalism is going to kill us. That's based, I said something like that. Let me see. <laughs> it was some variation of that thing that I say over and over and over again. <laughs> oh, I forget. I'm only, I'm only signed in to my other like twitter which is like the one for scaredy bird that i forget exists like every five seconds <laughs> face id do the stuff <laughs> this is apparently important enough for me to keep you on and not end the live yet until i pull up this tweet and read it to you <laughs> Because why not? <laughs> so this is what they said. They said, We're about to enter a hyper-deflationary economic boom, and it won't end until we reach post-scarcity. The second half of the 2020s will be characterized by the most dramatic improvement in our living standards in human history. It's going to be completely unprecedented. And I said, Oh, wow, show me where this crystal ball you have is so that I can also look into it and say stuff totally made up. And then I said... Colonial capitalism is literally killing us and the entire fucking planet. Get real. <laughs> like, Bert, come on. <laughs> like, but also, where's the lie? Like, and then I didn't end there. I also said, there is no realistic future in which we keep a colonial capitalist philosophy and the climate crisis doesn't kill us all. It's true. Like, I, I wish, like... 
it would be different if all the research doesn't say that and to to ignore it is an act of violence like truly exactly yes exactly like i don't have any tolerance for people that go around saying shit that's literally gonna kill us all like i i, I just can't even if they're like even if there's someone that's young and probably, hopefully, later in their life will realize how they were a lackey for a system that wants them to be disinformed and to lie to people. They tweeted again, and I also responded. <laughs> and they said, if there's no recession within the next year, 2020 will be remembered as the final recession in American history. There's no realistic way for one to happen ever again. Economic growth will be far too rapid moving forward. And I said, this is absolutely fucking nonsense, but you must be getting your bag for spreading blatant disinformation. Because facts. Because they have to be. You don't just go around saying shit like that without getting paid to say it. Because it's just so wrong. It's so, it's so, Mark, it's just absolutely not even remotely correct. Like, I just can't. I can't with people that do that. Because it's just as harmful, truly, as, like, who is it? There's that creator on TikTok, and I probably other places, but I've only seen people reply on TikTok, where basically their whole thing is they're trans, and they go around being transphobic. I mean, obviously, that's just one example. What's her name? Um, I always forget. There's so many of these. You know what I'm talking about, as if I need to explain it. Like, <laughs> there's a million of people that are, like, you know, of a specific group, and then they go around being like whatever the right wants them to be to to make an enormous amount of money it's not new obviously but it doesn't make it any better no matter how many people do it especially in a time when literally like it's never been more clear i think i yeah i think i think that's who it is yeah mm -hmm, the one i was thinking of she recently apologized and then immediately went back on it <laughs> so but yeah there was that one other creator who i forget their name is but they have uh i think they have purple hair they've done a really good and patient job of like debunking what they've had to say in a way that like is super gracious and cool and i super respect them for that i just can't remember who they are because <laughs> i got a really bad memory for names i usually just remember what people look like I shared a post by them once when they were talking about, like, people assigned male at birth and then, no, close. You would think it would be, so it wasn't Mercury Stardust, it was, it was somebody who made a post about, it was basically talking about people assigned male at birth and masculinity. And then the way that, like, thinking about being non-binary is probably a lot more attractive than they realize. Because the way that masculinity socializes you into, like, disregarding any other option. And then, like, they just, like, really approachably and, like, kindly talk to a person that at the beginning said something to the effect of, like, I would never be non-binary. And then the later, like, they inched them for forward into being, like, yeah, like, I don't even feel like a man. I just kind of, most of the time, just don't want to have any gender at all. And then they were like, yeah, you're right there. Like, <laughs> it was great. It was perfect. I was like, this is important. Like, this is exactly the kind of shit that, like, that this is, like, I mean, gen yeah, it was a great video. It was super great. I shared it. I think I, I both duetted it, and it was a long time ago, so you'd have to pr scroll back pretty far. Who knows, maybe the, I know, I can't remember what her name is. But her work is awesome. And she's, like, pretty young, but she's doing a lot of really important work. As if that makes it, like, as if young people can't do important work. You know what I'm talking about. Like, I'm, I'm impressed by this person for what they do and what they say in a way that is ageist if you didn't think that they could. <laughs> is what I mean. But, yeah, like, I don't know. They're doing, they do, do a lot of lives and they get like a pretty, yes, round glasses and curly hair. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm, yep. But yeah, I stitched it also. 
because that's how good it was. I was like, I need to do at this and I need to stitch it. Everyone needs to see this. And I forget which one got a pretty big viewership. It had like 40,000 last time I checked. So it wasn't like pretty big, but it was, you know, it was sizable. Pretty sizable viewership. Especially for something like that. There was a lot of people posting on it that were like, you know what, yeah. I actually also have never really felt attuned with masculinity, but then there were other people that were like, no, I do. And I was like, that's fine. Like, obviously, no one's talking you, if you actually feel comfortable with identifying as a man, no one is talking you out of that, by the way. Like, by all means, do it. But like, that's fine. <laughs> like, it's just, a, it's just another option. But if there are other people that in fact actually do not feel comfortable with it, this is a time to reflect to see if you do or do not, you know? Because either one is just as good. And all other options that are available. I know, right? Yeah, that's so true. But yeah, I see why you would say Mercury Stardust. Who, by the way, also recently wrote a memoir. I know because when I was looking at, like, new releases for memoirs, I was, like, a spot behind theirs. Like, the first day. I was like, holy shit. Like... I know that they're both new, and so that means we probably both sold, like, only around, like, five or six copies or something <laughs> during the very first day. But, like, yeah, I was pretty excited that I was, like, right behind it. And then the other one was Cody from, um, from fucking Queer Eye. And it was funny because in one second, I was number three on, like, the top new memoirs for, like, LGBTQIA+. And then the next second, I, I refreshed... And I was number four, and Cody was number three, and I was like, damn, that was fast. Like, okay, Cody, you make quick work of this. Like, <laughs> like, damn. Oh, no kidding, that's awesome. I know, I was thinking about, like, figuring out a way to do that virtually or something. Because that would be cool if I could do that. I would really like to do that. I don't know how one starts doing that, but I'm sure that there's a way. If there's a will, there's a way. Like, because I could easily just, like, visit people's classes or something. Like, virtually? Just do, like, a Zoom call-in? I know. I bet it's a lot easier than people realize. But I guarantee that Mercury Stardust, just because of her following, has an agent. And so, obviously, that's a downside of being, like, a smaller creator. Like, I don't have an agent. One day, that's on the list. So that they can do all those things for me that I don't know how to do. Right now, I'm all things. Except for, obviously, the mutual aid that I rely on to live. Which many of you offer me so that I can exist. Which I am eternally grateful to you for. <laughs> yeah, she definitely has read. Well, because they did her and... Who was it? I forget the other creator's name. They did that one... They did that fundraiser. Where they raised over two million dollars for trans healthcare, that was fucking incredible. I was like, holy sh! I was watching it and I was like, holy fuck! Oh, did it really? Oh my god, that's awesome! What does it look like? I haven't seen a physical copy of my own memoir yet. You gotta tell me what it's like, cause my my author copy it takes a long time to get here. It's not gonna be to my house in like till August twelfth. Yeah, Jory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's who it was. Yeah. Yeah, that was fucking awesome. That was so impressive. Like, it was just... Because what? They streamed for, like, a day straight. <laughs> like, it was like, holy shit. And that wasn't... That was, like, the second time they did it, I think? The first year, I think they raised, like, a million. But maybe not. Maybe they raised, like, 200,000 or something. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you for doing that. If you, uh, after you read it, and I keep forgetting to ask people to do this, so somebody that, uh, I knew from, my, like, high school read all of it in, like, the first day that they got it, and then they left a, a review, but it seems like on Amazon, if you post, like, a written review, Amazon reviews it, and it takes a little bit, but they rated it, and if you all, if you read it and you like it, could you rate it, please? Because <laughs> I think that helps. I've never po I've never published a pub like a print book before. So I'm really trying to get this thing out there, you know? Like I think it's gonna help a lot of people. But it's a hard read. Specifically chapter two. But also the part where I almost die. 
a couple times. Uh, in fact, at least three times. One, once because Arby's had the meats. Two because of pure evil. Or no, two because uh, a werewolf. And then three because of pure evil. I, always, I mix up those last two sometimes. And then four, too much drinking persistently for most of my life because of undiagnosed autism, which is very common. But yeah, so if you could do that, that would be cool. But be honest, obviously. Let me know what you think. Because, well, yeah, but you just, you just gotta read it. Because Arby's had the meats. One time I died. <laughs> I almost did. It was very, like, I should, I could have easily died. Like, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that was my, well, actually, no, at least four, no, no, I, I wouldn't have died the first time. It was just more of a meltdown than anything. But yeah, I was like, you just kind of got to read it. <laughs> nice, thank you. But yeah, no rush, obviously. I was like absolutely amazed that the person from high school like read it all in like such a short period of time. I was like, holy shit, like you really just speed run like all my trauma. Like, are you okay? Like, <laughs> literally, like, please, uh, if you could please take care of yourself because that's a lot. <laughs> It was hard for me to do in a couple weeks, and you just did it in a single day, basically. You know, that's legit, yeah. I understand. I feel like a lot of us are having a really rough time lately. It's hard out here. Okay, cool. No, I know, I get it. I know. Honestly, even if you don't do, like, a review, I think the rating just helps. Because I feel like, I don't know, there's something about, like, the, the algorithm there that basically if there's, like, more ratings on it, it will just basically, like, boost it more, I think. So, even if it's nothing, you know, it doesn't need to be anything fancy. <laughs> By any means. I like, I I think it was okay. It was a book. I, I read it. <laughs> Dr. Bird uh, is traumatized. That's what you could write. That's what you could write. <laughs> They've had a very difficult life. <laughs> But they aren't dead yet, and so now the world has to deal with them. <laughs> also, the it is not a trend. Because <laughs> like I said, I think that's the main... And I'm kind of regretting. I think I'm gonna... Like, lately I've been primarily just describing it as my memoir, but the main takeaway isn't just like, this is my life. It's more so just like, look at my life and how it exemplifies everything we know about recent research of neuroqueer, late in life realized autistic people. So I should push that more, probably, so that people realize, like, what it's about. Because I understand a lot of people are probably, like, in, even even with the, the followership that I have, a lot of people are probably like, who are you? Like, <laughs> but the main focus is, like, look at my life and how it exemplifies all these statistics that we have recently learned. Look at why and how this has hurt, like, harmed so many more of us than, than people realize. Like, especially other psychologists and shit. Because I've never seen, I've seen other plenty of autistic memoirs and stuff, you know, like in recent years that cover like other really important elements. And I tried to make sure not to cover stuff that I've seen in other ones. Because why would I, I don't need to repeat myself, you know, like mine, I think, tells a very specific version of this experience that I've never seen anyone else tell. And I understand why. It's because it's an incredibly traumatizing thing to do. <laughs> Just to be real, it is. Um, but it's worth it. I know it is. Like, and I know that I could do it. Because I did. And here we are. <laughs> because of all the things I've lived, it, like, it, like, it's funny because, I don't know about y'all, but, like, there was a point when I still, like, before I ever got Max or anything, like, because I always had PCs growing up, but, like, I remember playing on, like, microsoft paint with like images and like doing shit like that and i feel like whether it was that or learning how to like code in like a basic sense like through using like myspace and zanga or what else obviously the research with ai to learn about like chat gpt and stuff and then publishing and then never promoting my aid like poetry books all of that 
in ways that I never could have foreseen prepared me to do this and self-publish it and actually be able to do it, which was like kind of a surprise. Like it, it honestly felt like in, in the longest imaginable transformer fashion, I'd been like, or like a power ranger fashion. I was like assembling a megazord that allowed myself to self-publish this me like memoir for like a couple decades, at least, if not literally 30 years. Like, it was like, okay, <laughs> the feat is, like, learning how to do image editing. And then, like, you know, it just assembled over time to be the skill sets I could actually self-publish a book if I needed to. Which is, like, it's super weird how life works like that, you know? Like, it feels very goofy, but also, like, nice and serendipitous and, like, cool. Because, like, even though I don't know how to, like, self-promote myself in a big way... Like, obviously, it's nice to have had, like, people over the course of the last year, at least, be like, yeah, I want to read your memoir, because I think it'll help me. And so that kept me motivated. And then I was like, okay, I put this off long enough. <laughs> it's time to hyper-focus and make this get done, as I do. And then I knew that I could, and I did, even though it was hard. Lots of sobbing, that's for sure. But it was important. It was cathartic. And it I did the damn thing. <laughs> so now we all get to be uh, reap the benefits of it. You did. You did it. Thank you. <laughs> I am doing it. Have you tried the puffed Cheez-Its? I haven't. I don't eat any animal products, actually. So I don't eat, like, dairy. I haven't had Cheez-Its in a very long time. But I used to like them. I've had, actually, I guess there was, like, a, there was, like, a non-dairy version of Cheez-Its I had that were actually really good, now that I think about it. I forget, they actually almost exactly tasted like the other ones. I don't remember what, uh, what brand they were. So, I love potato chips. They're, like, one of my favorite things, especially dill, dill flavor kind, like, the, like, the dill lays, they're my favorite. Please, it's I'm not not quite, but good guess. <laughs> and then I also really love, for some reason, like in recent years, I've been obsessed with those watermelon outshine like uh, like fruit bars that are like frozen, like basically a popsicle, but they're like allegedly healthier because they're not just like artificial flavoring. Like someone just actually took watermelon and then blended it up and then froze it in the shape of a popsicle. <laughs> um, and then I also really love pumpkin seeds. And I got, like, a big bag of Sour Patch Kids not too long ago, but then I was like, this is way too much sugar. Like, I'll go through a phase every once in a while where I, like, really want candy. And then I'll finally eat some, and then I won't eat anymore for, like, another year. I know I gotta hop up, too, actually, but thanks for hanging out, everyone. But yeah, I, I just, like, I always like saltier snacks more than, like, sweet snacks. I know, they're the absolute, I mean, Aldi has really, really good, like, just, like, you know, just regular-ass salted pumpkin seeds. I get, like, a whole bunch of them. But I, I realized the other day that I'd already eaten, like, all four bags that I got. Because, like, you eat enough pumpkin seeds and it's a whole meal. <laughs> and there's nothing better than doing that. They just really hit the spot. I never really made pretzels. A pretzel, see, I kind of, like... I think I might be, like, I, it kind of, the pretzels, for some reason, kind of upset my, my stomach every once in a while. I've wondered sometimes if I might have, like, some sort of minor allergy to wheat. Because I get, like, stereotypically, uh, like, allergy kind of symptoms if I eat too much of it. Oh, I love mushrooms. At least, like, I really like, like, I mean, I guess I eat... I never really eat them, like, raw, but I really, like, I know they're always too salty, aren't they? Especially, like, I really like soft pretzels. That's something that, like, really hits the spot, like, especially with some, like, really good, like, I forget what it's called. There's, like, that kind of mustard that's, like, got all the seeds. Like, it's, like, they just took the mustard and then they didn't grind it up. I like that shit. That's good. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I like that, especially at, like, a brewery. Like, there's one... 
back in the town that I lived in before my PhD. And they had, like, this really, really good... Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, that sounds incredible. Po' boy, vegan po' boys are just, they're, oh, they're so good. There's so many, like, I'm just absolutely loving, because when I first went, like, and stopped eating any animal products, there was basically no good vegan places yet until, like, five years later. So I've been through the phase where, like, all that existed was, like, a boca burger, some fries, and, like, a salad. And I, like, did my, it was like I did, like, a fucking pilgrimage to, like, are you sure you're gonna do this? And then, luckily, I'm just autistic enough and stubborn enough to, like, be able to be persistent about it and was able to, like, find enough safe foods and then be so repulsed by, like, the idea of eating, like, you know, anything, like I said before, that was, like, like, overtly bones and, like, veins and cartilage and shit, because that's always grossed me out. So, but yeah, there's just been absolutely incredible, like, purely, like, and it'll be, like, you know, like, comfort food. There's this real, ah, oh, there's this good place when I first moved into this area. There's this place, it's called, uh, I think Soul Vegan. And they make, like, it's just, oh my god, it's so good. I can't afford it, but anymore. <laughs> but it's so good. They have, like, they fry oyster mushrooms, and it tastes exactly like chicken. Like, fried chicken, like, good fucking fried chicken. They have, like, greens and, like, all kinds. It's just, it's literally, like, after I ate their food for the first time, like, and this was, like, obviously during, like, summer, like, last summer. So, like, clearly COVID was still COVIDing, as it still is, but I went inside because I was so, I was just so absolutely obsessed with how good their food was, and I was like, this is some of the best fucking food I've ever had in my whole goddamn life, and I need you to know that. Like, this is incredible. Like, what you have here is an art form. <laughs> it's a in Cincinnati. It's incredible. It's like a chain. I think there's a few chains of it. But yeah, it was like easily some of the best shit I've ever had in my goddamn life. And I've had some good vegan food in my day because I grew up near Chicago. So there's always been like a lot of good. Like the I went to Vegan Fest in like, yeah, the summer before I finished. Uh, yeah, after I finished my master's, I went to Vegan Fest and I've had like some really incredible like variations. But that shit was just unreal. <laughs> See, I never really do, like, trail mixes for some reason. I'm kind of weird about, like, eating, like, too many ta- Like, I don't know, it, it usually gets too sweet for me. I used to- there was a phase, though, when I was, like, a kid or maybe, like, a teen, I forget, where I really liked the kind that was, like, rice puffs. You know what I'm talking about? And it's, like, maybe has a little bit of, like- it's got, like, the umami taste, and then there's, like, some- what the hell- like, wasabi. That shit's good. I know, okay, there was one, when I, so I went to a conference between my master's and PhD, and it was in Milwaukee, and I had, I know, yeah, it was so good, I had a vegan bon me from Milwaukee, and I was like, this shit's incredible, I've never liked, I, so I've never, like, even when I still ate anything animals, like, I never ate mayo, that shit grosses me out, so, like, there is a vegan mayo on it, because there always is, you know. And I didn't know that, but I still ate it. I just had to, like, wipe off enough of it so that I wasn't absolutely repulsed by it. <laughs> um, but other than that, that shit's good. I always saw it, because I, there was, one of my other favorite things to watch is just, like, Food Network TV. Like, I have seen, like, basically every, uh, what the hell's the one? Like, Sabotage? What's the hell? The one with Elton? I hear that guy's a total asshole, by the way. <laughs> but I can't, I can't remember what his full... Elton something. The one with the glasses? I hear he's actually, like, alt-right. Like, he, he's, like, he's actually a bad guy. Like, <laughs> the way that I was like, oh. So you... I mean, but it's like, he made the whole show about, like, having a cooking show where you sabotage people, and then, like, why would I expect him not to be? I don't know, Elton Brown, yeah. Yeah, he's a Trumper, exactly, yeah, that's what I heard. But yeah, I was, I watched a lot of that show before, way before 2016, so I couldn't have possibly known, and I felt actually betrayed by it when I learned. I was like, god damn it, like, wow. I never had a good radar, though, for people that aren't good, so, it's, again, no surprise. Oh, really? I didn't know you like cooking, Ed. That's cool. I know, I really liked, uh, 
I really like that show, and then I've seen a lot of Iron Chef, and um, I never liked Gianna. I don't know why. She gets on my nerves. I forget if I told you, and I got, I'm going to jump off after this, but for some reason, like, in my early 20s when I was working at Office Depot, which is actually, I forgot to mention that in my memoir, which is kind of ridiculous, but I learned a bunch of graphic design. Like, I just saw, my, like, I was spending a lot of time just, like, between orders and stuff, like, fucking around on Photoshop. And so I self-taught myself how to do graphic design in a certain capacity, and then I learned how to use, like, Illustrator and stuff. So anyway, I would, I would just do whatever the fuck I wanted in Photoshop, and for some reason I was so upset with Gianna once that I took, y'all seen the Dark Crystal? I think I already told you this ad one night when I was playing Stardew Valley. <laughs> but basically, I was I was so uh, just absolutely, like, annoyed, I guess, by Gianna that I photoshopped a picture of her face onto a Skixies, which is like the creature from, <laughs> the creatures from Dark Crystal that suck out the souls of the fucking little creatures. And then stay forever young like <laughs> like i was really just like hate i was a hater i was an absolute hater in my early 20s there was just always that something that seemed very off about her for me and apparently enough to photoshop her face onto a skitsies so <laughs> like if i could find that it might it might exist somewhere on something that i have So if I ever remember, I'll try to find that and show you all. Because I think I was pretty impressed with how I did it. <laughs> I was like, I literally like... <laughs> so there was like, on my campus, around the time when I was doing this, I was working on my bachelor's. And <laughs> this was way before I ever had any idea that I was going to continue for like a master's or anything. I was probably like a sophomore at the time. So I literally... <laughs> there were certain like rooms... For, like, kids that actually do graphic design. Because there's, like, obviously on campuses, there's only so many rooms that actually have, like, the sophisticated versions of Photoshop. So, <laughs> one day I literally went into one of those rooms. And, <laughs> and there was other people, like, you could tell, actually working on, like, school projects for graphic design. <laughs> and my ass was just in there, like, <laughs> like a sociology student. Like, it just be an absolute hater. <laughs> That's actually hilarious. Like, imagine, like, because, and I was sitting, like, in because it was in a room where, like, there was the door, and then, like, I was at a computer. Like, so anyone that would have walked by <laughs> could see what I was doing. And then, like, they would walk through to, like, sit at another computer. So, it's not like I was doing anything for school. I was just, like, taking up one of the important computers for an actual graphic design person to be a total hater. I don't know. I can't imagine how funny it would be if I was someone else and then saw what, like, just if you glanced at my computer, just because, like, you know, you do that sometimes, and then you saw that that was what I was doing, <laughs> like, it would be like, what the fuck? Like, what are you doing? Oh, what's up, Louie? Thank you, you too. I might jump off, though, like I said. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out, as usual. Hopefully you enjoyed the the peek into more of my poetry that had just, like I said, stays hanging out on my blog. Thanks to whoever it was that stocked it out, unless you're someone that I fucking hate, and then fuck off. <laughs> but I, I think that it wasn't. I think that it might have been someone else. But I'll never know. <laughs> Because if it's the person I think it is, they probably use a VPN. So, good for them. Good for them and their privacy. <laughs> anyway. Oh, what's up? I was about to jump off, actually. But it's nice to see you. Thanks for popping by again. Oh, you gotta... Oh, never mind. I misread that. Okay, cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah, EJ is so great. So, thanks for popping in. I So, I read, if anything, if you want to see what I was talking about tonight... I will export this video from my Twitch onto my YouTube channel because I read like a bunch of my poetry and stuff. And if you, if EJ probably shared it to you, if you didn't know, I wrote a memoir. Let me turn this a little bit. It's got the cover. This is my Twitch that you're peeking at. So this is the cover of the memoir that I wrote. And I finished it like three days ago. So check that if you like 
<laughs> very traumatized, substance abusing, sexually violated autists who are queer. This is a story about my life of being exactly that. And it's a story that I've never seen any other autists like write in a memoir style. So if you're into that, definitely check it out. I published it three days ago. It's in my link tree. What also is in my link tree, and also thank you, Win, <laughs> is my YouTube, which is basically in the top. Like I have all my social media. If you go to my link tree that's in my bio, all my little like social media icons, if you click on the YouTube one, that's where the playlist is. And it's just called Dr. Bird on Twitch. So after I finish this, I'm just going to export it. And I read a bunch of poetry tonight that will make a lot more sense if you read the memoir. I got poetry in the memoir too, but <laughs> uh, it explains basically all of the secrets that I've kept as someone who either didn't know they were autistic for the first 30 years or was just like keeping all the secrets of that lifetime for 30 years. <laughs> so the poetry will make a lot more sense if you if you read it. I also made, like, just another reminder, I made all of the eight micro chapbooks of poetry that are also on my uh, Amazon Kindle. They're all free if you have Kindle Unlimited, so you can just read those if you want to. <clears throat> I know it's so many people. It's, it's literally so many, so many, so many people that odds are good are and didn't know. So if you, I mean, and that's the thing when I'm sure, like, just like I did, and I talk about near the end of the memoir, like, the first time that I realized that I'm most likely, and, and it, I knew the moment I saw a video, it was, a, I was 27, it was 2017, I saw a YouTube video talking about the, uh, they called it female autism at the time, which obviously is, like, a reductive way to describe, like, we need to expand the criteria, like, the concepts of, like, a female autism have been debunked, even though, of course, they can lend usefulness to people. Like, it's important to recognize that it's not as reductive as, like, a male or female archetype of autism, that neurodiversity is the norm. And that's why so many of us were missed, so. Yeah, I remember us talking about that, like, the first time I think you popped in, Andy. So, I remember you saying that. Because I remember you asking me, you because I the first time I saw you, if I remember right, you were saying that uh, you asked me why I said there might be downsides to me getting the formal diagnosis, like why the therapist said that. And I was like, oh, no. Like, I remember being so, like, <laughs> I remember that very vividly because I was like, oh, no, I didn't mean it. Like, every obviously, there are absolutely upsides for many people if you get a formal diagnosis. There can be, for sure. Undoubtedly. Only any one person knows that for sure. Exactly, yeah. I know, that is, that's, <laughs> that's miraculous, Andy, yeah. You got lucky. Exactly, I know, same with me, when Like, it absolutely makes my, like, it, I, my life has, for the most part, never made sense to me. And that's why I called my memoir, I Have Been the Bad Guy, because I've been either treated, like, I've either actually been a bad person, trying to fit in as if I wasn't autistic, to be a discriminatory person, <laughs> to blend in. Um, or I've been seen as the bad guy because I actually act as I, who I, as who I actually am, which is an autistic person that is PDA profile. So I talk about that all throughout there. Thank you. You too. Good. I know it's me too. I feel like that's the one thing. That's why I knew that writing this memoir was going to be worth it despite the risks that I take and being as honest about everything about my life as I have been. Cause I know that like just in the last couple of years alone, the amount of solidarity and understanding of myself and like like i said just like even though like all of us aren't like we don't know each other in like a big big capacity like knowing and learning about the things that i have of myself and seeing other people make similar realizations like it's unmatchable like it is something that will absolutely change the entire course of the rest of our lives inarguably and it already has like in in good ways in ways that allow us to care for ourselves and for the first time, and it's hard, it's still hard, it's hard every single day, but it's, it's so much easier just actually knowing what the fuck is happening, because that's, that's what we've been robbed of, is not knowing who the fuck we actually are, and how can we care for ourselves if we don't know who the fuck we actually are? We can't. That's why all the substance abuse exists, that's why the sexual violence is the rate that it is, among other reasons. That's why the level, you know, the age 
uh, of expectant life is 36. What a weird way to say that, but you get what I'm saying. Our life expectancy, they say, at least based off of old concepts of autism, is 36. The levels of unaliving are really high because of, obviously, if you can't care for yourself and you are treated like it, a terrible person for your whole life just for existing or having to hide as who you are, it's not going to end up very well. So, exactly, yeah, and people just act like there's no autistic adults and then there's, there's no resources for us. Like, yeah, it's just, it's just a bunch of bogus nonsense that if you know, like, anything about, like, the old criteria and the things that we've learned in the last, like, 20 years, like, you know that, like, that's why it's happening. Like, it's, it becomes abundantly clear. But anyway, thanks for hanging out, y'all. I got, I got pop off, but as always, appreciate you. Thanks for being good humans and being whoever you needed to be to survive at any point in your life. Drink water. Do something nice for yourself. Eat a nice little snack. <laughs> And I'll see you around the internets. Buy my book. <laughs> Read my poetry. Watch my YouTube videos, etc. Have a good night or day. <laughs> I'm gonna try. <laughs>